Okay, good morning and welcome to the Ventura County Planning Commission meeting of December 3rd, 2020. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Chair White. Here. Commissioner Edukas. Here. Here. Commissioner McPhail. Here. Commissioner King. Here. Here. All right. Thank you. Uh, will you all please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The next item on the agenda, uh, public comments, the opportunity for citizens on matters not appearing on the agenda. Uh, we do have a, an email for people to send in any public comments or if they, were, if they care to make uh, comments on any of the agenda items that are coming up later. Uh, will the clerk please read that email address? Can you please submit your written email request to planning.pccomments at ventura.org, 250 words or less. That's P L A N N I N G mm. at P C C O M M E N T S at ventura.org. Please indicate in the subject line which agenda item number. We have agenda item number six and number seven today. Mm. Um, staff will read your comments into the Planning Commission. Any comments received after the time won't be read. We, will, we do ask you limit your comments to 250 words or less. Okay, thank you. Uh, item number five is approval of the minutes of the meeting of November 19th. Move approval. Second. <clears throat> we have a motion for approval and a second. Will the clerk please call the roll? Chair White. Aye. Commissioner Edukas? Aye. Aye. Commissioner McPhail? Aye. Commissioner King? Aye. Aye. Passes 4-0. Okay, the next item, item six on the agenda, case number PL19-0064, the appellants Jeffrey P. and Rebecca S. Smith. The case planner is John Okendo. John, take it away. Good morning, Planning Commissioners. Uh, just one moment, let me get set up. Once again, uh, good morning, members of the Planning Commission. My name is John Okendo, and I'm the project planner presenting this item today. Uh, the project before you is appeal case number PL190064, uh, an appeal of the Planning Director's Denial of Zoning Clearance, case number ZC190268. A reminder to members of the public and other interested parties uh, viewing at home that if you wish to comment on the project, that you may email your comment, 250 words or less, for this item to planning.pccomments at ventura.org. Please indicate in the subject line that this message is in response to agenda item number six and staff will read your comment uh, to the Planning Commission. Uh, John, may, may I interrupt you just sure. for a second here and do the disclosure statement? 
for the planning commissioners. At this time, I would like to ask each planning commissioner to state on the record whether or not he or she has received any oral or written ex parte communication regarding this agenda item that is not already contained in the record before us on this matter. Please disclose the substance of that information only if that information is not contained in the record before us on this matter. Will the clerk please call the roll? Chair White? I have no disclosures. Commissioner Dukas? I have no disclosures. Commissioner McPhail? Uh, <clears throat> I have been at Solomar Beach to two or three different homes over the past uh, 40 years. Thank you. Commissioner King? No disclosures. Thank you. Okay, please proceed, John. So the action under consideration today, uh, the appellant is requesting that the Planning Commission grant an appeal and approve a zoning clearance for the authorization of repair and maintenance activities in support of a rock revetment located adjacent to an existing single family dwelling. The appellant is Jeffrey and Rebecca Smith, represented today by David Armstrong, will be presenting on behalf of the property owner. The project site is in the Solomar Beach Colony and it's addressed as 2960 Solomar Beach Drive, approximately five miles north of the city of Ventura. The general plan land use designation for the project site is Residential Beach. Uh, the the seawall falls within the open space land use designation for the general plan. Uh, the coastal area plan land, land use designation for the site is Residential High with the 6.1 to 36 dwelling units per acre uh, modifier and is zoned RB for residential beach with a minimum lot size of 3,000 square feet. This is an isometric view of the project site. So the project involves the installation of 135 tons of rock on approximately 40 linear feet of an existing revetment in front of the subject property. The seawall is located on a 9.96 acre lot owned by the Solomar Colony Homeowners Association. A 0.05 acre vacant lot identified as parcel I is located north of and adjacent to 2960 Solomar Beach Drive. So that's the vacant parcel you see highlighted in red. That is the um, site that will be used as the temporary construction staging area. So this was the condition of the property as of uh, July 30th, 2019. So you see the project at the top of the page is looking north towards Santa Barbara. You can see the condition of the seawall um, the project below that is the uh, beach access stairs, which access the shore uh, from the property. <clears throat> and the uh, construction staging area or parcel I, the condition of that property is shown uh, on, on the far right. So that shows you a, an existing uh, mature tree and uh, some ice plant that's uh, located in that lot. This exhibit shows uh, what we received during the zoning clearance request. So it's exhibit five of the Planning Commission staff report. It's the project plan submitted with the zoning clearance application. You see a profile view of the project site with uh, a beach control line and a design shoreline identified and a profile of the uh, existing seawall. And then on the right hand side of the screen, you see the maintenance and staging plan where the applicant identified where they would be placing the uh, um, 135 tons of, of of additional armor rock uh, to be placed on the seawall. <clears throat> on March 18th, 2019, the appellants applied for a zoning clearance pursuant to CZO section 8174-6.3.2 subsection A, which exempts repair and maintenance activities that do not involve enlargements or expansions from a discretionary coastal plan development permit. However, the CZO also notes that there are exceptions and some repair and maintenance activities still require a coastal plan development permit. So more specifically, repairs that would occur uh, in a sand area and within 20 feet of coastal waters requires a coastal PD permit. 
The proposal before you today involves the placement of riprap on a sand area within 20 feet of the ocean. <clears throat> Exhibit four of the Planning Commission staff report includes the June 14th, uh, excuse me, we have to go back. <clears throat> Pardon me. So exhibit four of the Planning Commission staff report includes the June 14th planning director's denial of the appellant's request for a zoning clearance. The director determined that the proposed pr repair did not qualify for a categorical, categorical exclusion from the coastal plan development permit pursuant to CZO section 8174-6.3.2 subsection, subsection B3 Roman numeral one. <clears throat> The appellant asserts that the addition of 135 tons of rock on top of the existing revetment qualifies as repair and maintenance because no work will occur seaward of the mean high tide line. No environmental impacts would occur because the rock will be in the same approximate location as the previously approved revetment. And the amount of rock that will be placed uh, on the revetment is less than 20%. As previously noted, the, the county's uh, CZO includes the permit requirements for repair and maintenance activities. These permit requirements also are recognized in the Public Resources Code or, or Coastal Act, as well as the California Code of Regulations for which the CZO regulations are originated from. There are instances when a zoning clearance may be granted for repair and maintenance. However, the regulations also identify specific permit requirements for repair and maintenance activities to seawall revetments. As stated in the California Code of Regulations, section uh, one, uh, 13252, the placement of riprap uh, is, if the placement of riprap is uh, placed on a beach or on a shoreline protective work, a coastal PD permit is required. <clears throat> Further, if the construction materials are within 20 feet of coastal waters, that also triggers a coastal PD permit. The appellant notes that the rock is less than 20% of the materials being added. That may be true. However, the project must also comply with other regulations, namely the placement of rock and its proximity to the ocean. For zoning clearance to be granted, the planning division would have to make a determination that the proposed project complies with the established standards set forth in the CZO, standards to repair and maintenance at, to repair and maintain existing revetments do not exist within the county's local coastal program. In contrast, the CZO, the Coastal Act, and the California Code of Regulations identified this type of repair is not exempt from a coastal PD permit and instead requires an evaluation of potential impacts to its neighboring properties and the structural integ integrity of the revetment itself. As a result, the installation of 135 tons of rock onto the existing revetment within 20 feet of coastal waters requires a coastal PD permit. As it uh, relates to CEQA, so our determination under the California Environmental Quality Act is that this, uh, uh, the project or, or the action requested today is exempt uh, un under CEQA under sec uh, guideline section 15270 related to denial actions, uh, which can be applied in this case. Which brings us to our recommend recommended actions today. So in closing, staff recommends that the Planning Commission take the following actions, that, that you certify that the Planning Commission has reviewed and considered the staff report and all exhibits thereto, and all evidence and testimony received during the hearing, that you find that the project is exempt from CEQA pursuant to section 15270, that you deny uh, the appeal, uh, case number PL190064, and uphold the Planning Director's decision to deny zoning clearance ZC190268, and decline to refund any appeal, appeal fees and specify the location, uh, it, it, excuse me, specify that the clerk of the planning commission is this, the custodian of the records for this decision and, the material, and specify the location and documents that con, uh, constitute the record of proceedings upon which this decision is based. <clears throat> A reminder to the public that if you wish to comment on the project, uh, please send us an email. Uh, at uh, planning.pccomments at ventura.org. Comments should be 200, 250 words or less and will be read into the record for this hearing. 
please indicate in the subject line that this message is in response to agenda item number six. Um, the applicant does have a presentation. Um, however, uh, in advance of that, uh, I am available for any questions that the commission may have. Okay, thank you, John. Do any commissioners have questions of Mr. Okendo? Commissioner McPhail. I do. Uh, yeah. I have, uh, John, I have a question. I didn't catch it the last time, but uh, one of the requirements is the structural integrity of the seawall has to be determined. Well, the actual seawall is buried under tons of rock. So to be able to do that, they would have to remove all the rock to make sure the seawall is intact. And to me, that just does not make sense. Commissioner McPhail, Jennifer Welch, John's manager. In, in reference to the structural integrity, you are correct. The seawall is on a fabric and then rocks were placed on the fabric. What's meant by that is that the rocks don't become dislodged again in the next storm surge. So you wanna make sure that it's engineered properly without compromising the existing revetment. But if, if that's a requirement, and I understand what you're saying, but if that's a requirement, all the rock along Solomar Beach would have to be removed because it's one solid seawall. It's not sectioned off by individual pieces of property. So to me, that just does not make sense because if you got to remove all the rock, why not let them put more rock in to make sure that rock doesn't flow out to the sea, which it does after every storm? Everybody knows that. You lived here more than six months, you know that. So I, I, I just, I find that requirement uh, to be really overstepping what should be required. That's, that's my comment. Do any other commissioners have questions? Commissioner Educas. Could um, Mr. Aquendo explain why we are hearing this again today? Sure. Um, so the decision uh, at the previous, so the, the planning commission did previously hear this item in October. Um, the decision at that time was vacated uh, because the uh, public participation component of this um, had been compromised. I believe that the, the public could not uh, participate. We received um, a notice or a letter from the applicant or, or the appellant after the hearing um, that there was some support for the project that, that was not, not able to be uh, entered into the record um, due to the technical difficulties that we were having during the meeting. Um, so uh, we are presenting, representing this item to, to uh, the commission today. Thank you. Any other, uh, Commissioner King? Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Okendo, uh, the last time we heard this case, there was a question about the diagram of the seawall, the kind of um, uh, sideways drawing of how the seawall was constructed. And during the hearing, it seems to me that it came up that that wasn't actually drawings of the seawall at that location, but rather was drawings from another location uh, with the assumption that all the seawalls are basically the same. Is the drawing that we're looking at now different from the drawing that we looked at uh, with the original uh, packet that we got? Uh, prior to the last hearing? So no, it's it's the same drawing, but just a clarification on that to, to, to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, the drawing that, that was received and distributed is the drawing that was um, effectively turned in with the zoning clearance. Uh, my understanding of that, and, and I will give the opportunity to the applicant to clarify, that um, the section that had been prepared was specific to the site. Um, it was a, a uh, um, in, uh, prepared in conjunction with a um, coastal hazard report that, that had been prepared uh, for the property. Um, it had been repurposed and, and put in together with the maintenance and staging plan 
uh, to, to depict the condition of the property. Okay, I'm not sure I understand your answer then. Either, you know, that is or isn't a diagram of a different um, location. Are you saying it is not a diagram of a different location as was previously given in testimony before this commission? So, so let, me, uh, let me bring up the drawing. Commissioner King, this is Jennifer Welch. I think this yes. would be better answered by um, Mr. Armstrong, who submitted the diagram. I believe it was a rendition of what potentially could be there, um, and it was included in a coastal wave run-up study. But I'll have to defer to Mr. Armstrong to clarify. I'm fine with that. I wasn't really sure whether that question should be directed to Mr. Okendo or Mr. Armstrong. So fine, I'm, you know, Mr. Armstrong, I'm sure is taking note of the question and will respond to it. Thank you. Okay, uh, John, I have a question. Uh, I'm understanding from your presentation that what county planning staff is saying is that they're not saying no to the entire coastline in Ventura County that you can't repair a revetment, but they're saying, you're saying that when that is being proposed, that's what's needed is a coastal PD permit. Is that correct? Yes. So the, 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 the improvements that were proposed with this zoning clearance, reviewing this as the, a scope of work, we are saying that this, this type of uh, project would require a coastal plan development permit. And that a zoning clearance by itself is not adequate. Correct. Okay, thank you. Any other questions uh, by commissioners of staff? Okay, hearing none, I guess uh, we have an opportunity now for the, the appellant's uh, representative to present or the appellants themselves, uh, you have the floor. All right, if you could just give me a minute to share our screen. Okay. Will you please identify yourself, whoever's going to make the presentation? Hi, my name is Dave Armstrong, and I'll be presenting on behalf of the applicants. Uh, I am uh, a friend and co-worker of uh, Jeff Smith, not a paid consultant or lawyer or anything, just uh, a friend and co-worker. Um, I will address the, some of the Planning Commission members' questions uh, during this, uh, and when we get to the cross-section, for example, I'll specifically address Mr. King's questions. Um, and then some other uh, issues uh, that came up. Uh, the chair's question about the CVP application, I have some questions for staff about that as well. Uh, next slide, please. So the Coastal Act, and this is also reflected in the CZO, says that no coastal development permit shall be required for, types of develop for certain types of development including the repair or maintenance activities that do not result in an addition to an enlargement or expansion of the object of those repair or maintenance activities. None of, the, none of those apply to this. There is no addition to, there is no enlargement and no expansion. So first checkbox. Next slide, please. Now, of course, as staff has pointed out, there are, are constraints on that that if the commission determines that certain extraordinary methods of repair and maintenance, so extraordinary methods involve, that involve a risk of substantial adverse environmental impact will require a CDP. So they have to be extraordinary and risk adverse, substantial adverse environmental impact. Next. Next slide, please. Okay. 
So there are three areas in the code, the CZO section 81746.3.2B on repair and maintenance activities. I've summarized them because there's three different ones that, um, that are in this code section. The first area is the seawall. Section one is the seawall, uh, revetment, bluff, retain wall, breakwater, groin, culvert, basically infrastructure um, work. Second is dredging, which this is not a dredging project. And three, which staff has also brought up, is maintenance of facilities, structures, or work located in ESHA, any sand area within 50 feet of the edge of coastal bluff or ESHA, or within 20 feet of coastal waters or streams. So to give you an idea of how, this, how the code is structured. Next, please. So our proposed scope was done um, was fashioned based on the code and sticking with um, those constrictions and avoiding any risk of substantial adverse environmental impact. It's to replace 20 or so rocks on the face of the existing revetment. I should point out these are capstone rocks. Um, the filter bed and moon or uh, man stones are all in place have been field verified by a, a licensed coastal engineer. So this is only the capstone, the very top that have been eroded. There's no modification, expansion, or increase, just repairs. And the coastal engineer's analysis has said the project will have absolutely no impact on the beach environment and is an, a very minor project indeed. That's part of our submittal. Next. So again, as I said, we took great lengths to make sure that we were in compliance with the code. Uh, we got permission from the HOA to use, I'm sorry, can you go back? Thank you. So um, to avoid any contact with the sand, everything will be staged from above on an adjacent vacant lot that's covered with ice plant, not ESHA. Uh, and the, the maintenance area is set back from the toe of the slope and away from being within 20 feet of the mean high tide line. We'll go into that in more detail. Next. So this is, uh, this is the cross section, which I believe Commissioner King uh, was referencing. Um, this uh, is consistent. So this is as a, uh, um, as was stated earlier, this is a single seawall that goes on for more than a mile. Um, and this is how it was built. This is consistent with a 1977 county approved uh, drawing before the coastal development permit was issued of how it was built. Um, however, when we did a public records request to the Coastal Commission, they did not, were not able to provide us the actual drawings um, from that coastal development permit possibly because the wall was already in place before the Coastal Act uh, came into effect. But the county, this is consistent with the county approved drawings for this wall and has been field verified by our coastal engineer as being consistent with this section of the wall. They came out, they inspected it. It is consistent with what the county approved back in 1977. This one is actually from 1986. Um, so this is the original structure of the uh, of the seawall, um, and you could um, and as uh, Ms. Welch said, you can see that there's the construction of it is on solid ground. It's not on the beach. There's an existing filter bed. It's 18 to 24 inches thick, got by man stones, uh, the smaller man sized stones, person sized stones and then capstones that hold it in place. There's no structural change proposed in this at all. It's merely replacing the very top layer um, that has, is over time, over the last 40 years, has eroded away. Next. So, and actually uh, just a quick correction, um, staff in their slide showed stairs that are not part of the property. These are the, this is the actual property and stairs. Um, so we, we believe we are in compliance with the CZO. It's not located in an environmentally sensitive habitat area, not located in a sand area. It's adjacent to a sand area, but not in the sand area. 
um, and not located within 50 feet of the edge of a coastal bluff and not located within 40 feet of coastal waters or streams. Next. So if you remember from our previous, the, the, one of the primary determinants of all these things is that there be no, no risk of adverse, sig, uh, significant or substantial adverse environmental impact. So if you look, a, z, a zoning clearance does not require CEQA. Uh, but if you look at similar projects located nearby in similar circumstances that have been fully vetted uh, fully uh, a full CEQA analysis by the Coastal Commission, uh, looked at in great detail um, and determined not to, ha to have no significant impacts based on their seawall improvements. This is a 2012 Caltrans seawall project on Solomar Beach, uh, 12 foot wide, 1800 foot long rock revetment, demolished and rebuilt 605 concrete piles uh, drilled 54 feet deep. That is a foundation. Uh, this is drilled into the, the uh, sand area. Our wall, by contrast, is not built on the sand wall area. It's built on solid ground with just a filter bed. There is no foundation. Next. And there are no significant environmental impacts. Uh, the other one is actually going on currently or within the last few weeks. Uh, this is a California Resources Corporation Solomar project, same beach. Uh, as you can see, massive equipment on the sand, major changes to the re revetment, and still no potential, no adverse Im environmental impacts um, associated with the work on the seawall. Uh, next. This slide from a couple of weeks ago. This shows you the activity on the beach. We aren't proposing any activity on the beach, and yet this had no significant environmental impacts. Um, that's a pretty major project. Next. Uh, another one down further in uh, South County. Um, this is a seawall project, um, another Caltrans project near Thornhill Broom, two 100 foot high walls, 800 feet long. Uh, located on what were mapped tidelands that were subsequently changed. And again, no findings of significant environmental impact on a project of this size for the seawall. Next. Next. Uh, so staff in their presentation said that the reason for the denial was uh, the sand, the lo being located on the sand, but the actual Stated basis for the denial based on a June 14th, 2019 letter from Winston, Winston Wright uh, said that um, projects are not exempt from a coastal PDP if they involve substantial alteration of the foundation of the protective work, including pilings or other surface or subsurface structures as they relate to a seawall or shoreline protection zone structure. That's the first part of the first section. There is no foundation. Um, next slide, just to show you where this fits in the code. Next. So this is the actual code, CZO code section. We have proposed no work on the foundation and staff at, their la at the last hearing said it wondered why we brought this up. Well, that is the stated basis for denial uh, and the basis for this appeal but there is no work. The staff is now not bringing that up. Um, so um, next slide. For the coastal engineer project is li limited to replacing some missing rocks on the capstone outer layer. Foundation will not be touched. And quote, the amount of rock to be placed in this project amounts to less than two tenths of 1% of the rock in the entire community revetment. According to David Weiss, our coastal engineer. Next. Now, the, the June 14th denial letter also included an additional basis. It said, additionally, um, it, they cited code section 8174632B3, section 3I, uh, because the scope of the proposed activities, repair activities, involved the placement of solid materials on a structure within a sand area. Next. So again, here, here is the um, approved uh, 
uh, County of Ventura plan for this wall uh, in this location. It covers the entire thing and it's exactly the same as the, the other information. The original wall clearly was not built on the sand. Uh, it was uh, the filter belt bed is built on solid ground. You noticed in those bigger Caltrans projects, they had to put huge pilings in to hold it up because those were adjacent to the, those were right on the sand and they required significant foundations, which would risk potential impact. There's no pilings here. This is set on solid ground adjacent to the beach. The next. Uh, uh, can you advance one? One more? Yeah, it'll, it should be a, a line. So this is the only area that we're talking about. Set well back from the sand. It is not on sand. If you look, it's set uh, on rock, uh, within the existing rock bed. Uh, it is not um, on top of, it's not adding any height to it. Um, next. And that level shows where the sand ends. That's, and obviously it fluctuates. This is um, a coastal area, so it fluctuates, but this, the sand ends at the toe of the slope. Next. So all work, uh, all rock will be staged in place from the HOA lot above. Rock placement is landward of the toe of the permitted revetment. Next. No work within the sand area is proposed. So the original permit, uh, coastal development permit uh, from 81 requires a deed restriction for lateral access from the toe of the rebetment as determined by the fluctuating sand level on, on the beach to the mean high tide line. Esta this establishes that the toe of the revetment is where the sand level ends. The project description is set even further back from that toe. So this is clearly not on a sand area. Next. And I know Commissioner King doesn't appreciate this one, but I think it's really important because we're not saying, hey, they got theirs, why don't we get ours? But this is during this appeal process, the county determined that this, this very same revetment was not in a sand area, was not within 20 feet of coastal waters, and issued a zoning clearance. Next. And, and they did so rightly. Um, it's for the repair and maintenance of a concrete uh, pathway, um, uh, some stainless steel railings, um, and the permit is being issued through the exact same code section, 8174, 6.3.2 of the CZO. The same things that are being applied to our project that determined it's not in a sand area, that it's not next to coastal waters, were applied to this, 14 doors up, same seawall, and found that there was, no, there was no requirement, there was no finding that it was placing solid materials within 20 feet of coastal waters or within a sand area. And staff has never explained how this is different, how this is in a sand area, but this uh, zoning clearance was not. Next, please. Uh, it's this is located at 3040 Solomar Beach Drive. It was issued on July 9th, 2020, while this appeal was a pending. Uh, and we've already gone over the CZO section. Next. This is where the repairs were done. Um, and then the uh, you can go out, move to the next one. This is the county approval um, of the, um, the improvements and um, on the same exact same revetment with the exact same uh, design. Uh, next. So, uh, so you can see here's, here's the existing sand, sand area. And it's, there aren't improvements within the sand area. Next. Uh, so same revetment, 14 houses away. Ventura County correctly determined, well, while debating this, that the placement of solid material, concrete and stainless steel, or construction material was not within a sand area. Next. So uh, 
the county also determined it was not within 20 feet of coastal waters. So we submitted a professional coastal survey that established the mean high tide line at the time of our application. The revetment is located actually 40 to 45 feet away, more than twice the distance required. And the maintenance, the maintenance area is set back even further from that to make sure that there is no potential for impact uh, to any beach area. Uh, next. So the code provides for repair and maintenance, very fixed standards and objective measurements uh, for repair and maintenance and interpretation is not appropriate. Next. Uh, so this is a ministerial action consistent with uh, CZO section 8181-3.1a. The project description is to replace rocks that have eroded over decades with no changes. The original fully permitted CEQA reviewed design completely within the scope of the original permit and the engineer reviewed the records and determined no impacts. Next. Conclusion. Um, what I would like to kind of add here is um, a little, hold on one sec, I write paper. Is that, um, so the staff today uh, introduced a new uh, argument um, to justify what, what we call their single rock theory. Now staff has told us that if you place one rock on a seawall, it requires a coastal development permit. They do this by, they justify this by cherry picking limited phrases from this code section. But the courts have actually established canons of construction or rules in, of interpretation for statutes that both the courts and administrative agencies follow. One of the primary uh, canons of construction is that every word and every provision should be given effect. Here staff proposes just the opposite that four words in a single subject section eliminate any repair work on a seawall. This extreme interpretation ignores the purpose of the statute to allow repair and maintenance of the seawall of seawalls under limited, very limited conditions and effectively reads the other three sections of the repair and maintenance provision, subsections one, three, and four out of the code. If the code prohibits the placement of a single rock on a seawall, then there is no need or purpose for the prohibition on working on the foundation or the restriction of the quantity of materials used or the prohibition of construction equipment on the sand for such repairs. As applied to this application, this subsection prohibits placing solid materials on top of the sand, something uh, the, that we agreed not to be done. Um, and or increasing putting things on top of the shoreline protective work um, and increase by and in, thereby increasing its height, a condition that the Smiths have also agreed and is not part of the project description. The appeal should be upheld, uh, and uh, staff should be directed to issue the zoning clearance. And um, that kind of concludes my presentation. But I would I have a quick question for staff. Um, uh, the Chair White's question to staff was can the applicant apply for a coastal development permit? And I would ask that a question again. I would like it on the record. Can, in these circumstances, the applicant apply for a coastal development permit? Good morning, Mr. Armstrong. This is Jennifer Welch. Yes, the, our local coastal program provides the pathway to apply for a coastal PD for repair and maintenance of a seawall revetment. And if I may add, not all discretionary permits are subject to CEQA. There are instances where you can be found exempt, even though you're a discretionary permit. Okay, so you're saying that even though the seawall is not on property owned by the applicant, that they can file themselves for a coastal development permit. I have that on record. Uh, and and for, for the record, that, that, that was not your question to staff. That's a separate issue. Uh, the, the property owner's permission would be required as part of that submittal. 
per but the, we could not, the zoning ordinance. The applicants could not file a CDP for this work. Excuse me? The, the applicants on their own could not file a CDP for this work, correct? If they do not own the property, then, then you're correct. They would need permission of the property owner. Okay. I want to make that clear. That concludes my presentation. Okay, thank you, Mr. Armstrong. Do any commissioners have questions of Mr. Armstrong? Uh, if I might, uh, this is Jeff Smith. I would like to speak briefly. Um, if this is the right time or after your uh, questions to Mr. Armstrong. But either way, I would like to speak here today as I did before the, at the last hearing. Okay, certainly you will have a chance to speak. Do any, any commissioners have questions of uh, Mr. Armstrong? Okay, Thanks. not hearing any yeses, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, uh, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair White and uh, Planning Commissioners. Um, good morning. Um, as you all know, I'm Jeff Smith and my wife, uh, Rebecca, is right next to me here. Uh, and we are the applicants. I have asked uh, Dave Armstrong uh, to represent us at this hearing. And I do not plan to uh, repeat his analysis. However, I do want to briefly offer what is really the human side of this application. Um, this application is not just about um, the application of a, an ordinance to the maintenance of a seawall. It has a direct, substantial, and long-lasting impact on my wife's and my lives. This is not a vacation home that we're living in. This is our permanent home. It is actually the home which we hope to spend the rest of our lives. And as you well know, houses require maintenance and repair. Paint, new siding, replacement termite-infested wood, doors, electrical work, whatever. And like all homers, homeowners, including yourselves, you know, we are constantly doing uh, repair and maintenance projects. And because we're lucky enough to live at the beach, we also have one more little project, and that is maintaining the seawall that protects our home. And that is a critical part of our maintenance projects. Without a functioning seawall, not only is our home at risk, but so are our personal lives. Now, it was over three years ago that we started this process when I noticed that the seawall in front of our home had deteriorated and needed maintenance. And just as we did, we remodeled. We followed the rules and decided to obtain any necessary clearance before proceeding. There were other options. We chose to follow the law. As Dave explained, we first reviewed the coastal zoning ordinance. And there it was, section 8174-3.6.3.2 of the coastal zoning ordinance which basically says you don't have to get a coastal development permit. And instead you can engage in repair and maintenance activities on a seawall by obtaining a ministerial zoning clearance. And it's hardly a surprise when you think about it. A coastal development permit by its own words is to deal with development, a new project a large project, a, a major, major modification, not just something simple like repair and maintenance. And we all know that structures have to be maintained. As Davis said, and I guess I have to keep saying this because they keep, staff keeps coming up with weird things. We don't plan to enlarge, increase the height, modify, or add to that seal. We do not plan to make any changes to it. Instead, we simply want to maintain our existence and return it as close as possible 
to its original condition. And again, the, the, the repair and maintenance activities provision has basically four objective, easily determined um, provisions that have to be satisfied. And that's all that has to be satisfied. We can't alter the foundation, we're not going to. We can't uh, put any work on the sand, we're not going to. We're not going, uh, you can't replace more than 20% of the materials of the, of the uh, seawall. We're not going to. And finally, we're not, you can't put mechanized equipment uh, on the sand. And again, we're not going to. We have satisfied all those objective uh, uh, requirements. And those are the only requirements in the ordinance. There is no requirement to go get some sort of approval from uh, public works or, or dilly dally around on something else. If we show those four things, we're entitled to a zoning clearance. Now, again, as I said, we have carefully maintained, crafted our um, project to fit, to fit this. And again, we have submitted not one, but two uh, detailed um, engineers report. These have actually rebutted any and all of the questions that were raised by staff here or at any time before. And it's interesting they don't even mention it because of course the basic final conclusion of that um, engineer report is, and this is, an, this is a, a quote, that there will have absolutely no effect on the beach environment. And there is nothing in this record, even though we've been doing this now for three years, to, to the contrary. Our effort to follow the law has been time consuming and very expensive. We had to obtain a survey and a surveyor's report. We have submitted, as I said, not one, but two engineers reports. The first report was a full report with an upper study, everything you could possibly want. What did staff do? They sat, thought it was too confusing and asked us to withdraw it. And then at the last hearing we heard from staff, oh boy, um, they didn't submit an engineering report. Well, yes, we did. And you can see both of them now um, in the uh, record. We had to seek legal and consultant advice because we were constantly dealing with the staff's ever shifting excuses for denying our application. The latest one now is that somehow we're putting rocks on top of a shoreline protective device. We aren't. We've said that all along we're not putting it on top. We are working on the face of the revetment in the middle portion of it. We have complied with the uh, uh, repair and maintenance code. We have followed the law. And now, quite frankly, it's time the staff to do the same. We request that the Planning Commission direct staff to issue the zoning permits immediately. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smith. Do any commissioners have questions? Commissioner A. Ducas. Yes, thank you. Um, good morning, Mr. Smith. You said something that I took note of that um, we chose to follow the law and I thought I heard an implication that Others, perhaps you're you're aware of others who have not. Um, am I right in my um, in in hearing that undertone? Yes, uh, there have been others um, in the past who have used have um, done repairs. That's well known by everyone. I'm not going to talk about any specifics, but yes, that's true. And anyone who's been at the beach knows that. Okay, so it's not part of um, of your argument. It's not part of the uh, documents that you have submitted. Uh, okay. Again, as I said, I am doing something here. I am coming to you and asking for a zoning clearance, which I believe that I'm entitled. And basically, I have been out been um, jerked around for almost three years. One and a half years just to get a denial from the staff. 
then we've had delays, part of it from COVID, uh, part of it because of scheduling issues from us and actually also a medical issue on our side that has delayed the appeal. But the initial denial took forever. And um, that's what's been going on in this case. Yeah, I, I hear your frustration. I, um, I just wanted to, um... To clarify that uh, that uh, you said we chose to follow the law, we have. Isn't that the whole point? Thank you. Are there any other questioners by commissioners of the applicant, the appellant, I should say? Okay, uh, let's continue with the public hearing. Uh, do we have any? Uh, public input that has come in that could be brought into the record? If so, uh, please read it. Okay. Would you like me to read the emails before the Zoom? We do also have a Zoom person that would like to comment. Okay, yes. If we have somebody on Zoom, uh, let's let's bring them in now. Who would that be? Um, this would be James King. We have two James Kings in the... We have in the house today. <laughs> okay. We're, okay, there we go. Is the uh, voice working here? Yes, go ahead. You have the floor. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, Jim King and our, the uh, Jim King, not Commissioner Jim King. And uh, myself and our family have owned the property adjacent to the Smith since 1968, almost as long as the 60 year old seawalls existed. And after hearing these presentations, I sympathize with the commissioners, the staff, and the Smiths that have to deal with these complex zoning provisions, which seem to me to be uh, for really um, common sense, simple repair. Uh, since we've lived next door, we've seen many repairs made over the years, many, many, with no adverse effect to the beach, character, appearance, or public enjoyment. Any disruption is usually caused by kids building sand castles in the ocean currents, which cause vertical sand elevations to change three or four feet in a few hours. Fortunately, the subject maintenance doesn't touch the sand. I think it's also important to point out that the homeowners association owns the adjacent property to the Smiths between our house and the Smiths. So the staging and repair and movement of equipment around will be done on private property and there won't be any adverse effect to uh, other roads or the sand or anything. So it, it's kind of a unique situation having the opportunity to use the homeowners association property. The seawall is man-made as you all know, subject to nature and requires maintenance. Uh, we've got to preserve its structural integrity, the residents property values and Ventura County's tax base. I'd look at it as similar to replacing a broken uh, front door to keep intruders out. You gotta keep maintaining these properties. Uh, are they gonna go south? Uh, as it was pointed out, there's no changes to the, uh, uh, to the height or width of this seawall and it's all within the 1983 permit. Uh, I'll try not to repeat what other people and uh, Mr. Armstrong said. Uh, as the adjacent homeowner, we view the application as a common sense minor maintenance request. The, we hope and feel that the work should also delay any repairs to the rocks in front of our house and the neighboring homes along Solomar Beach. Doing nothing will only increase the scope and impact of future seawall maintenance and provide more cost, time, and effort on everyone's behalf. And the seawall is only as effective as its weakest link in the section in front of the Smiths has deteriorated. So on uh, behalf of Sue and myself, the next door neighbors and long-term residents of Solomar Beach, we recommend your approval of the request. What are we doing anyway? Request the, your approval of the denial request. But anyway, approve the project. And on behalf of all the Solomar Beach residents, Thanks for the time and effort that you're putting into this uh, needed repair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. King. Uh, do we have others on Zoom? I have 
have no other Zoom. Or we, do we have some ask? emails to read? I do have one email I've received. Uh, go ahead and read that. It's from William Kearney. It says, Dear Commissioners, my name is Bill Kearney. I am a resident of Solomar Beach and currently serve on the Solomar Beach Homeowners Association. I moved to the Rincon Solomar for Rhea and Seacliff in 1978. Since then, I have owned and lived in three homes at Faria and our current home at Solomar. I mentioned this to underline the fact that I have witnessed several severe storms and the damage that storm surf can cause to homes and neighboring homes with inadequate or poorly maintained seawalls. Over the years, I have observed rock riprap settling or actually sinking, which, necessi which necessitates adding rock to the top portion of the riprap. I personally believe that the Smith seawall needs to be beefed up. I understand that our committee denied the Smith's initial request due to a concern about the potential impact on the beach in front of our homes. Sensitive to your concerns and the importance of moving the Smith project forward, the Solomar Beach Homeowners Association agreed and encouraged the Smith to stage their additional rock on association property and utilize colony access ways to do the necessary repair on their seawall. Our association stands unanimous in our request that you approve the Smith's application as soon as possible to avoid the onset of our winter storm season. Thank you, Bill Kearney. That's all I have right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is now the opportunity for the appellant to, uh, to make any additional closing comments before we close the public hearing. Do either Mr. Armstrong or the Smiths have anything to add to, uh, to what was said previously? I don't have anything to add, thank you. Um, I just wanna thank everyone again. This, this has been a, uh, a lengthy hearing I know and uh, there are a lot of issues um, again want to urge you to uh, direct staff to issue this uh, ministerial permit. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, okay, time for staff to uh, make additional comments. Uh, either Jennifer or John, whoever wishes to. Thank you, Commissioner White. I will take the, the closing comments. Um, the first item I'd like to mention are the diagrams of the revetment that Mr. Armstrong described and which Commissioner King had wanted clarity on. And correct me if I'm wrong, I think Mr. Armstrong noted that the first exhibit does depict the existing revetment. However, the second exhibit approved by the Coastal Commission, not the county in 1981, is very different. And so I'm just curious as to why there's that difference in an approved exhibit in 1981 with the current exhibit that was submitted with the zoning clearance. Second, the CCNRs provide guidance to understand the permit path for repair and maintenance. And there are instances where exemptions apply for repair and maintenance. But when it comes to seawall revetments, it provides additional guidance. And in this case, the proposed repair and maintenance requires a coastal PD. Hypothetically, if the zoning clearance were the appropriate permit path, all of the property owners would be allowed to apply rock with a zoning clearance. And that would be absent any review by county agencies. The ultimate result would be a piecemeal approach to repair and maintenance of this seawall, and thus could compromise the structural integrity of the revetment. The investment the Smiths have incurred has not been wasted and can be applied to the coastal PD and planning would be more than helpful in that process. That's the end of my closing comments. Okay, thank you, John. Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, nothing at this one. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, do you want to uh, respond to uh, Jennifer's comment? on the exhibits? Uh, we did a public records request for the um, coastal development permit approval and did not receive diagrams from Coastal Commission or from the county that I'm aware of. 
but the the cross section was field verified to be consistent with the 86 uh, plans that we submitted as part of our in the coastal engineers report um, that those are act, those are uh, consistent with what's in place currently thank you okay staff is that satisfactory response or do you have any other comments to make on that uh, just one final comment. Uh, I believe Mr. Armstrong was provided the Coastal Commission staff report in 1981, which this exhibit was included. It is included as in, in his PowerPoint. Okay, thank you. I see a waving hand from Commissioner McPhail. Uh, might have a question. Yeah. Uh, John, can you go back on your presentation? I think it was the second or third slide where he had three different pictures of the seawall. Or the rock? Okay. Uh, the one on the lower left, there's a couple of rocks sitting on the stairs. What kind of permit would they have to have to remove those rocks off the stairs? You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna advise John not to to answer that. I don't think it's it's wise to get into hypotheticals with, uh, or I should say, incomplete hypotheticals, because we don't know what else the project could entail, and it's not relevant to this project in my in my mind legally. Well, I, I Jeff, I'm going to disagree with you because uh, that's got to be some kind of maintenance, and what we're talking about here is the the two definitions of uh, maintenance on a piece on the seawall. Now, you're the attorney. I've got to go with what you say. But to me, uh, I just need to know in my mind what kind of permit that they would require to move those rocks. I think it's a legitimate question. But if you say no, that's what I'll go with. And wait. I do say no, and, and, and your, your role is to, to look at the rules and apply the rules to the project before you, as opposed to asking how the rules could be applied to a, a project that's not before you. And it's, it's fine for you to disagree with staff on this point regarding the project before you, but I would say that's, that's where you should focus your attention. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Okay, I have another question, Mr. Chair. Uh, you stated that uh, part of staff's problem is that if uh, the appellant just goes with a discretionary permit, it would be piecemeal. So are you trying to tell me that if everybody in that almost mile stretch of Somalar Beach came in at one time, they could get a discretionary permit because it wouldn't be piecemeal? Commissioner McPhail? As Jeff had indicated earlier, the HOA, as the property owner, would have to also act as the applicant. And because it's the, the seawall is on their property, if they want to come in as individual properties, they are entitled to do that. And we would look at each individual permit in relationship to the extent of that seawall and any cumulative future repairs would be accounted for through that process so that if say for example 10 properties came property owner, or 10 property owners requested repairs at least we would have knowledge that as these repairs were coming in that they were all in sync with a consistent engineering philosophy for the entire length of the seawall if for instance one of those property owners chose not to repair and everybody else around them repaired, there could be a potential significant impact if the seawall is drastically different than adjacent properties, and thus the reason for discretionary review. Zoning clearances are over the counter, and it's a ministerial permit, meaning you can objectively check off the boxes. And so as rock gets laid onto this revetment in this piecemeal fashion without that cumulative or um, comprehensive review over time, 
there could be potential impacts to that seawall. But there's already substantial impacts to the seawall, number one. Number two, they have permission from the homeowners association to do the repair and maintenance. So uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I think your comment is, uh, I can't think of the right word right now, but contradictory because they have permission from the Solomar Beach Homeowners Association to do the repair and maintenance. They've stated that. So uh, I, 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 I don't think that's a legitimate argument. And, uh, you know, it's, it's no different. It doesn't seem to make any difference to me whether what section of the seawall wall needs to be replaced. Basically, what you're asking, or what you would like to see, if I'm reading you correctly, is all of them come in at one time and do repair and maintenance, which means part of the problem is going to be they're going to have to have equipment on the beach. This project has no equipment on the beach. They're only replacing the very top cap rock with 20 plus or minus rocks. I think we're hung up on the hundred and something ton. These are huge rocks. Each one of them probably weighs 10, 15, 20 tons anyway. So uh, I, I, I think there's a lot of contradiction here. And to request a study of the main part of the seawall, you got to remove all that rock to do it. And that's just, to me, that's incredulous. You're asking them to go way beyond what is necessary because if they got to check the integrity of the seawall, part of it underneath the rock, they've got to do it the whole stretch of Solomar Beach, not just in front of the Smith's house. And, and I, you know, I made these comments last time and I haven't changed my mind. I think Everything here has been overstepped, in my humble opinion, and I'm going to stick with that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner McPhail. Uh, do any of the participants have anything further to say or ask? Uh, hearing none, I'm going to close the public hearing and, and begin deliberations. Uh, any commissioners? Uh, care to speak up? Uh, Commissioner Aducas. Yes, thank you. I, I just have um, a couple of questions, I, um, I believe, for Ms. Welsh. Um, does it make a difference that uh, the appellant has said that these rocks will be placed on the face of the revetment and not the top? The code is, is guiding us to state that if the rock is going on a sand area and then the California Code of Regulations further states on a revetment and within 20 feet of coastal waters, which we know this revetment is inundated on a high tide, then it requires a coastal PD. Mr. Armstrong may be correct that it doesn't expand, enlarge, or extend the rock rip that, and less than 20% of rock is being placed. However, we have to look at all the regulations. We're not cherry picking. We have to consider all the regulations as they relate to repair and maintenance. Okay, further, um, he, uh, Mr. Armstrong made the argument that it is not within 20 feet that he has a mean tide line that states that, that supports his contention that it's 40 feet, not 20. That, that could be correct, the mean high tide line, but I know this area and it does get inundated with high tide, meaning coastal waters. The code does not differentiate between mean high tide, seaward, or landward. It says coastal waters. 
Okay. And my observation was wet sand and, and uh, whatever moved that rock that Mr. McPhail was uh, talking about was probably not a kid playing. It was probably water. Um, there was one more argument. Let me bring it to mind. Uh, having to do with it being um, not on, not in a sand area, that this in fact is um, not gonna be on the sand at all. The, um, the area where the, the project is located is on uh, land, not sand. Could you respond to that argument? I'll agree with Mr. Armstrong, the rock won't be literally placed on the sand. However, the revetment is on the sand and the rock will be on the revetment. That's how we've interpreted it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Aducas. Uh, Commissioner King, do you have any comments? Ah, there we go. Sorry. <clears throat> I've thought a lot about this case <clears throat> since we first heard it. <clears throat> and no matter how I slice it, I still come down to the fact that um, this is one of many properties that have revetment in front of them. And approving this appeal opens the barn door for, or, or kind of creates a precedent for every single property owner to make the same approach, but every single case is likely to be different. As I read, and have had presented to me the coastal plan. I don't care how we parse whether it's on sand or not on sand. Fact is, it's within 20 feet of coastal waters. And that is crystal clear. That exception doesn't say anything about mean high tide lines. It simply says within 20 feet of coastal waters. And when I look at the pictures presented by the appellant, I see the water well within 20 feet of the revetment. So, uh, you know, I, I, I find that argument not persuasive. Frankly, I think this job needs to get done. I think the, the appellant original applicant ought to address it and he's tried to address it. I just think He's trying to force the issue on the path when, in my mind, the path is clear in, in the Coastal Act and in our local, co local coastal program, and that is correct path is with a discretionary permit. And there, I don't care how persuasively the appellant argues, I still come back to that. So. I'm going to have to stick to my original um, uh, support to uphold the staff's uh, recommendation. That's all I have to say. Okay, thank you, Commissioner King. I want to ask a question of County Council, the same one that I asked the last time we uh, discussed this matter. And uh, Commissioner King referred to it, and that's the, the question of precedent that if, if, the county planning commission and or the board of supervisors were to make an exception to county staff's uh, conclusion that this project needs a coastal PD permit, that might that not set a precedent that could be used by other applicants in the future and, and thereby uh, defeat uh, what county staff is trying to do to have a consistent, coherent uh, permitting scheme for uh, protecting the coastline. Uh, 
As I mentioned before, you know, legally, each each project and each permit application is is separate. So, as a technical legal matter, it wouldn't set a, a, a legal precedent. But that being said, it 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 could set a, a practical precedent where um, future applicants cite the decision in support of their own request for a zoning clearance. Um, again, just as a practical matter. So, so in, and it seems likely that would in fact happen. Okay, thank you, Mr. Barnes. Uh, I wanna say that in my time on the Planning Commission, one of the scariest things that uh, came to us as planning commissioners was the study done on sea level rise in Ventura County and what should be done about it. And it's alarming. And uh, if we think we have problems now, just wait because the ocean is rising. The conflicts between beachfront houses and the ocean is only gonna get more and more severe as time goes on. Uh, I, I've been a defender of, of trying to uh, make sure that properties that come before us uh, for permits, uh, pay attention to having adequate seawalls. And, and, I, and I do believe that the county has an obligation to, uh, to do what it can to continue to protect these properties, uh, whether they're homes or roads or, or railroads or whatever. Uh, it's gonna be more and more of a, of a problem down the road and I think the county needs to have clearly defined uniform standards by which uh, applicants such as the Smiths uh, will know uh, what, what they're headed for uh, when they do need to do a repair on their seawall or, or their revetment uh, because it's gonna happen over and over again. I think the county staff has already made a determination as to what the standard is. And they've said that this kind of repair needs a coastal PD permit. Uh, I, if I were to, uh, to try to do an improvement of my property, which is not at the ocean, but if I were to try to do an improvement on my property in Ojai and, and, and claim that, um, I could just go get a zoning clearance to, uh, to do an addition to my house and forego pulling the required building permit, I, I would get turned down and I could appeal it to the whoever, the board or the courts, and I would still need to get a, a building permit. I think that it's imperative that the Planning Commission defend the county staff on this matter They've made the determination that this kind of repair needs a coastal PD permit. It's not saying, no, don't, don't repair your revetment. It's saying you need to go through this process to be able to do it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna move that uh, the Planning Commission uh, approve the staff's recommendation to, to deny and uh, uh, move forward with all of their recommendations. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Okay, Commissioner King seconds. Is there any discussion on the motion? Commissioner A. Ducas. I just want to say that um, I don't I don't agree with the chair that we need to defend staff. That's not what. Um, our, our charges here at all, but we do need to uphold um, the standards that are in place. And um, I just wanna say that uh, I, I intend to uh, vote for the motion, but um, I just wanna say that I am sorry that uh, the applicant feels jerked around and um, feels uh, 
the way he does about other people not following the law. And I just want to um, express that I recognize that um, he did do the right thing in attempting to um, interpret and follow our laws. And um, that's what we're here for. Okay, thank you. Uh, any uh, Commissioner McPhail? Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Aducas, for that comment, because I totally agree. We're not here to defend staff at all. We're here to do to make a determination on what the code says and the ordinance says. But with that said, I still have a problem with, uh, I think they still are setting a president, staff is, especially when they say they don't want projects to come in piecemeal. Uh, that's, that's an individual person's opinion or staff opinion and uh, I have a problem with that. So I'm going to vote no on the motion. Okay, thank you. I, I do want to respond to my support of staff. Uh, I do in general support staff. I do not always support staff, as uh, you all know. And when I, when I disagree, I, I do say so. I do think it's important that people who live at the beach or have properties at the beach have, have standards by, by which they can uh, know they, they can do what they need to do. And I think the staff in this case has defined what that is. Uh, any other comments by commissioners? Hearing none, uh, let's, uh, let's call the roll on the motion, please. Chair White? Aye. Commissioner Dukas? Aye. Commissioner McPhail? No. Commissioner King? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries, 3-1. Okay, the motion carries, so that takes care of item number six. I'm gonna call a 10-minute uh, recess and we'll, we'll get back together approximately 20 minutes after 10 and continue with the agenda. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna reconvene the meeting. The next item on the agenda, item number seven, is case number PL 20-0005, Los Angeles Prayer Mountain. And before we get started with uh, Mr. Okendo's presentation, I wanna do the disclosure notice. At this time, I would like to ask each planning commissioner to state on the record whether or not he or she has received any oral or written ex parte communication regarding this agenda item that is not already contained in the record before us on this matter. Please disclose the substance of that information only if that information is not contained in the record before us on this matter. Will the clerk please call the roll? Chair White. I, I would like to mention that uh, I, I am familiar, very familiar with the uh, applicant's architect, Dave Anderson, whom I work with regularly in my engineering business, AE Group Mechanical Engineers. However, I'm not uh, associated with this project at all. Uh, in the past, I, my company gave a, a proposal to another architect. This is, I don't know, between five and 10 years ago, uh, another architect for a project at the same site, uh, which never happened. Uh, I, have, uh, I don't consider myself to have uh, any conflict on this case. Commissioner Dukas? Yes, um, I took a drive out to the site uh, yesterday and I observed um, how far it was away from um, the heavily forested areas. I also um, drove through the, um, I'm not sure what to call it, the wash uh, when uh, 
there is drainage, you have to drive through a little um, area that um, has concrete around it, um, but is uh, it definitely gets uh, water flowing through it. And one other thing I'd like to point out is in the tentative schedule, um, it noticed that this was for a period of 50 years instead of 20 in error. Commissioner McPhail? No disclosures. Commissioner King? No disclosures. Thank you. Okay, we have a staff presentation by John Okendo. John, you have the floor. Your mic's not on. Good morning, members of the... My mic, uh, I'm coming through. Okay. Good morning, members of the Planning Commission and members of the public. Once again, my name is John Okendo and I'm the project planner presenting the next item. The project is conditional use permit case number PL200005, uh, a CUP, CUP request for uh, LA Prayer Mountain. Uh, a, a quick reminder to members of the public and other interested parties viewing at home that if you wish to comment on the project that you may send an email, 250 words or less for this item to planning.pccomments at ventura.org. Please indicate in the subject line that the message is in response to agenda item number seven and staff will read your item to, uh, will read your email to the Planning Commission. The applicant, Los Angeles Prayer Mountain, is represented today by Dave Anderson uh, and Joseph Hong. Uh, the request is for the approval of a conditional use permit to authorize the continued operation of a retreat with sleeping facilities for a term of 20 years. LA Prayer Mountain has a relatively recent permitting history and was authorized by the Ventura County Planning Commission under a CUP granted in 2007. The facility opened in 2013 with the finalization of, of building permits and the authorization of the use inauguration zoning clearances from the planning division. The term expired in March of 2017 as the permittee had not sought formal extension of the use permit term as required by the original conditions of approval. Staff determined that a new CUP required, would be required for continued operation of the facility. So to orient you, the 10.36 acre parcel is located at 14735 Lockwood Valley Road. The site is addressed off of Lockwood Valley Road, though the site is physically located off of a private unnamed access easement which connects to Chico Larson Way, which Chico Larson Way is the, the street that connects to uh, Lockwood Valley Road. Uh, the general plan land use designation for the project site is open space, and the property is zoned open space uh, with the 10 acre minimum lot size modifier. So this is the, the zoning map for the, the subject property and the surrounding area. Here are the project plans. The property is already developed, uh, or excuse me, the property is developed with an agricultural structure, a private residence, and other uh, appurtenant buildings which are not within the proposed CUP boundary for the project. So you see in this uh, uh, picture uh, the, irreg the irregular boundary of the, the CUP. So it's the dash line that's going around uh, uh, several of the buildings. The, the home uh, and the agricultural building are at, at near the center of the, the page. And the CUP boundary um, goes around those uh, buildings. Um, the CUP boundary stretches down to the left-hand side of the page to, to include an existing water well. And you see uh, five of the buildings which are included in the proposal. They're, they're known as prayer cabins, uh, which are also on the, the left-hand side of the screen. Um, the multi-purpose building and dormitory are on the right-hand side of the screen. And you can also see the 100-foot uh, uh, fuel modification located around the property. So the uh, uh, dormitory building and multi-purpose buildings um, located in the upper right-hand corner of the screen um, are, are included in the project boundary. And uh, the CP boundary is also developed with uh, uh, on-site parking. So you see that at the center. The CUP will authorize the use of the existing dormitory, the five prayer cabins, and the multi-purpose building, along with other, other accessory components within the CUP boundary. 
a note on the dormitory building. The project description also reconfigures the dormitory to permit no more than 15 beds to maintain total sleeping accommodations, which include the five prayer cabins uh, for no more than 20 people in accordance with the, the NCZO. So the applicant is, is requesting a new CUP to authorize the continued operation of the retreat uh, for a term of 20 years. Retreat guests will include members of civic and cultural nonprofit organizations and various churches. The retreat will be open year round. Uh, the facility will uh, also host a limited number of meetings and special events for guests. Uh, these gatherings, uh, the uh, special events will only occur on the weekends and the maximum attendance will be 50 guests inc inclusive of overnight guests, of any overnight guests uh, present on the property. No new development is proposed with this request. So here's the property condition as of uh, February 22nd, 2020. On the left-hand side of the screen, you see the, ac the access easement uh, or the, the road which connects to Chico Larson Way. Um, the buildings, uh, so this is looking north, I believe. Um, the buildings uh, or the residence you can see um, at the center of this, the, uh, the photograph, and this is the, the access easement which connects to the property, provides physical and legal access to the site. The picture in the center is the multi-purpose building. So this is the, uh, the building that's used for uh, uh, meetings associated with the retreat facility and uh, the dormitory, which is uh, on the right-hand side of the screen. So with, with respect to environmental review, uh, staff determined that the proposed project qualifies for an exemption under the California Environmental Quality Act, Section 15301, for Class 1 projects uh, related to existing facilities, as the project consists of the issuance of a new use permit for the operation of an existing facility with no expansion of use. And that brings us to our recommended actions for today, which are as follows. So we recommend that the uh, Planning Commission certify uh, that, that you have reviewed and considered the staff report and all exhibits thereto, and all evidence and testimony received during the hearing, that you find that the project is exempt uh, from CEQA under Section 15301, that you make the required findings to grant the requested CUP, uh, case number PL20005, pursuant to NCZO section uh, 8111-1.2.1.1A, uh, based, based on substantial evidence presented in section E of, of the staff report, and grant uh, CUP case number PL20005, subject to the uh, conditions of approval. And also finally specify that the clerk of the Planning Commission is the custodian of records and the location of those documents and materials that constitute the record of proceedings upon which the approval decision is based. So I'm uh, once again to members of the public, if you wish to comment on this item, please send us an email uh, at planning.pccomments. Um, again, that's planning.pccomments at ventura.org. Uh, indicate in the subject line that it's related to agenda item number seven and staff will read your comment to the Planning Commission. Uh, I'm available to the Planning Commission if you guys have any questions uh, regarding the, the staff report or staff's presentation. Okay, thank you, John. Do any commissioners have questions of Mr. Okendo? Commissioner A. Dukas. Am I unmuted now? You're good. Okay. Okay, um, I forgot to add that um, I was on the commission in 2007 when this was first approved. I just wanted to um, direct one question to staff. Uh, since the um, facility has been opened in 2013 to when, um, you know, now, uh, have there been any complaints from uh, the, the people in the area about, about the operation of this retreat? Um, so we, we've just to give you the, the, uh, um, the, the <laughs> so we did check the record. We did check Acela to verify that there were no complaints and, and what we determined was there, that there weren't any. We also discussed with the applicant, we made it very clear that, that um, had there been any issues with um, surrounding property owners um, while the facility was being operated um, during that time. And no, we did not see any uh, uh, complaints. You're smiling the same way I am. You, you, this, is, this is a very remote and extremely peaceful area. Um, Additionally, besides um, asking about the complaints, um, 
how uh, the, I mentioned before this wash that you have to um, drive over or through. Um, how how is this uh, project conditioned to protect people from any um, I don't know danger of being caught in that wash during a flash flood or some other storm? So um, we we don't have any specific conditions related to to flash flood. Um, however, I would state that it is subject to the review by the Ventura County Fire Protection District. So uh, VCFPD um, did state uh, in, during their review of the project that that the the conditions that were applied on the original permit would be applicable to um, the the uh, new request. Um, so we did include in there requirements for, for review for uh, public safety um, as far as, as fire access goes. And that does include um, the requirement and, and the applicant had, had is, has already um, uh, expressed interest in, in, in complying with these conditions. Um, in particular, there's a, a requirement for a road, road maintenance agreement. Um, and um, Without knowing the specific nature of that, I believe that the property owner uh, has some responsibility for contacting um, uh, property owners along the easement to make sure that the road is maintained, uh, our access is maintained from uh, Chico Larson Way. So that is one way that physical access is going to be maintained um, with the, the life of the permit. Um, and uh, I, I, th I think that covers it. So if, if you have any specific questions about the fire conditions, that, that, that's where I would point back to. Commissioner, okay. I do guess, uh, I'm sorry. It's not, uh, it's not fire. Um, it would be uh, the only thing that I'm looking at, and, and this property is by no means unique in the area that has um, several areas of road that gets washed out. And, uh, and just a sign that says, do not cross, you know, or, or caution, you would think people would have good sense and, and you wouldn't need to um, have signage to say do not um, enter a, a wash when there is flooding. But um, I do believe it had a sign that said, it might have had a sign that said flooding, but um, an additional do not, you know, do not cross when there's water present. Uh, it might be advisable. Okay, any other commissioner questions of, of uh, John? I understand uh, we have the applicants, uh, or the applicants prepared to make a presentation? If so, uh, please speak up and identify yourself. Uh, yes. Uh, my name is uh, Joseph Hong, and I work as a director in Los Angeles Prairie Mountain. And I was involved in this uh, uh, ministry for approximately more than 30 years. But unfortunately, our leader, Pastor Lim, uh, she passed this coming March. And uh, when she was operating this place for past decade, for uh, last three years, she's been uh, struggling with her health. And that's when we missed this renewal uh, time because everything was not really functioning uh, as it way you used to when her health was failing. But uh, as uh, John stated that we operated this place and there was no complaint whatsoever. We have a very strong relationship with our neighbors and as uh, far as access, uh, yes, we do have a flood, uh, like maybe once in a, every other year or so, but uh, snow, but we have no problem. Uh, we had no problem whatsoever in past decade of uh, fire department, paramedics, uh, uh, sheriff's department coming over to our property uh, to assist us in time of our need. Or nor we have any uh, congregation member uh, getting stuck out here or, or, or having a, tr um, a road problem in accessing our place or going out of our place. And uh, I guess uh, that's about it, uh, uh, sir. Okay, thank you. Do commissioners have questions of the applicant? 
Uh, hearing none, uh, I'll go ahead, Commissioner A. Ducas. Uh, we just want to express our condolences for the loss of your um, pastor. That's very sad news. And I just want to say that um, it's it's not um, often that I get to see something that um, was approved and then came to fruition and operated. And um, I was very impressed with the facility when I visited. It's um, a beautiful, peaceful place. Um, how are you doing with COVID-19 now yeah. that um, uh, yeah. we're facing this problem? Right. That's we uh, are uh, sort of having a uh, uh, challenge in a way, a uh, challenge to a good effect, meaning that we're not having any visitors at this point. Uh, uh, barely, we just have uh, one uh, uh, guest coming in and, and having a retreat. So the most guests that we could probably accommodate at this point is a maximum capacity of 10 people or less. Uh, you know, uh, primarily they're just family members and one family come and another family, uh, 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 you know, it's like a rotation. One family would come, they would go down, another family would come. So it's not even 10 at, uh, at this point, maybe it's five people, 10 people, but we are limiting ourselves to 10 at the most at this point. Ten, and, and they're basically family members. I understand. Well, um, this time will pass. Thank you. Okay. Any other commissioner questions? Uh, I see the uh, applicant's architect, uh, Mr. Anderson. Do you have anything to add to the conversation? Uh, we're not able to hear you, Dave. I'm, I'm going to take the hand waving as it, that you don't have anything relevant to add to the conversation. Is that right? Okay, great. Um, <laughs> I'm not good at reading lips, but uh, I understood the hand gestures, I think. Uh, okay, uh, any other questions of staff or the applicant? Commissioner McPhail turned on his light. Uh Oh, you haven't closed it yet. I was just going to make a motion to approve it. Okay, if, if there are no further questions, do we have any emails that have come in on this matter that we need to read into the record? No, we've not received any emails. Okay, hearing no further uh, input, I'm going to close the public hearing and begin planning commissioner delivery. Deliberations, uh, Commissioner McPhail, you have the floor. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve PL 20-005 uh, for the 20-year term of the CUP. Second. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Uh, any... Uh, no further comments from anybody. If not, uh, let's call the, call the roll, please, on the motion. Chair White? Aye. Commissioner Edukas? Aye. Commissioner McPhail? Aye. Commissioner King? Aye. Motion carries 4-0. Okay, great. That takes care of item seven. Thank you, Dave and Joseph. The next item is discussion, the report by the planning director, or in this case, the planning director's designee, Ms. Welch, uh, on uh, board actions and other matters. Thank you, Chair Wright. I just wanted to say thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Very you. Thank have, you. A, have a good day. So, um, the one last hearing for the year 2020 before the planning commission is December 17th. And that is to hear the coastal zoning ordinance amendments to revise the landscaping requirements. 
within the non-coastal zoning areas of the unincorporated areas of Ventura County. Starting your year 2021, you will be hearing an informational item on the Somas Ranch Farm Worker Housing Project on January 14th. And then on February 4th, you will be hearing another round of amendments, this to the non-coastal zoning ordinance again, to allow beekeeping accessory to a dwelling and to remove regulations for beekeeping accessory agricultural and commercial beekeeping. So it can be all about bees. For the Board of Supervisors, their last hearing will be December 15th of this year. The planning, the planning division has three items on the agenda. The first is a consent agenda item authorizing the planning division to receive a National Park Service Historic Preservation Fund grant in the amount of $5,000. And then um, we also have county ordinance regulating the cultivation of industrial hemp and supplemental text amendment to the county zoning ordinances referencing the proposed ordinance. And then finally, a report back on the feasibility of retail sales of medicinal and recreational cannabis in Nylon Acres. Beginning the year for the Board of Supervisors on January 12th, uh, the planning division will report back on the feasibility again of retail sales of medicinal and recreational. Oh, I'm sorry. That de December 15th item that I just mentioned about the report back on the feasibility of retail sales is scheduled for January 12th. So the first of the year. And then on January 26th, we have a major modification to the Tolan landfill conditional use permit for a time extension. Okay, thank you, Director Welch. Um, okay, at our last meeting, I had asked uh, County Council if they would come today and bring a, a status report on the litigation that's uh, pending uh, regarding items that uh, came through the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors uh, in the last couple of years. Yeah, yeah, thanks. And I don't, I don't have a PowerPoint, but I, I can, I can give you an oral report. Uh, so we have a number of um, of cases that are pending, um, and I'll, I'll try to go in in order of uh, of project. These projects go back a few years. Uh, the the first uh, project approval that was challenged um, is the wildlife corridor ordinance uh, that was, I believe, it was passed in. Let me back up. First, first, the good news: the the one project that that was challenged and the, the litigation has been resolved is um, is the vacation rental uh, ordinance, the the vacation rental overlay zone in um, in the Ojai area. That was challenged and litigated, and 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 we the, the county won. We successfully defended that lawsuit, and so the, those rules do stand as approved without modification. Um, the second project that was challenged was, as I mentioned, was a wildlife corridor ordinance, um, which established overlay zones to um, facilitate wildlife passage. That's in litigation. Um, we are um, finalizing the administrative record in that case. And the way these cases work, um, not to go into too much detail, but the first step is always to prepare the administrative record of proceedings, it's called. And so that um, basically includes all the, the staff report and all the public comments and um, staff notes and, and communications regarding the project. And so in these cases, the first step is to put that together. It takes a lot of time and there's always back and forth. And so the, the wildlife corridor ordinance, we're, we're finalizing the administrative record in that. It's, it's taken a while. Um, no, no briefing schedule or, um, or trial, which is basically a hearing on the administrative record has been set yet, but we're getting close to that point. Um, another project that approval or denial could, that was challenged. Could I interrupt you on that one? Of course, yeah. I thought I read in the paper or heard somewhere, maybe on the radio, that, uh, that the judge in that case allowed uh, another group to join the county and defending that 
Is that? Oh yeah, gosh, yeah. Thanks for thanks for being on top of that. Yeah, the the um, uh, uh, a few separate um, non governmental organizations intervened in that case. Um, they're represented by uh, a legal clinic that's run out of UC Irvine. And so, um, yeah, their, their motion to intervene was, um, was granted a few months ago. And so they, they will be a party. And yeah, like you said, they uh, intend to submit uh, briefing defending the ordinances. Um, and uh, let's see, the, the next, um, I think chronologically, it could be wrong, but the next project um, that was challenged, decision that was challenged was the uh, Renaissance Petroleum uh, Oil and Gas Project that's just south of um, the city of Oxnard. Um, it was denied by the Board of Supervisors. I believe your Planning Commission also recommended denial, although I can't recall for sure. Um, that administrative record is almost done, um, so uh, still need to set a briefing schedule and brief it and, and have a hearing on that case. Um, the next... Uh, project uh, is the, um, you'll probably remember the um, Old Creek Ranch Winery uh, violation case that was heard by your planning commission. And, and I think it was, uh, I want to say it was you unanimously um, moved to uphold the violations. I could be wrong. The board was, was the same. That was challenged by the, the, the winery's owner. Uh, we, we have certified the administrative record in that case. The winery since added a few more kind of follow-on claims, um, but that, that case is moving on along a little bit faster than the other ones, um, but we still need to brief it and, and have a hearing on that. And um, then I think that brings us to the seven lawsuits that were recently filed against the county challenging the county's um, approval of the 2040 general plan and um, certification of the accompanying EIR. And so we, um, the, so I, I, I have a list of the, um, the, the plaintiffs there. ERA, um, I think it's ERA Energy, uh, Lloyd Properties, which owns um, mineral, which owns land where they, they lease mineral rights, um, Western States Petroleum Association, Colab, uh, the County Agricultural Association, uh, Carbon California and California Carbon Company and a, a, an organization called CalWorks, which is uh, basically um, kind of industrial slash construction companies combined with unions. Um, so those are the plaintiffs. And th th it's kind of like a, a shotgun approach to challenging a lot of aspects of the, the EIR. And so they're... Um, so that's the main thrust of the lawsuits. They're also, um, the, the, the mineral rights holding plaintiffs are also alleging that policies um, uh, unconstitutionally take their, their, basically their mineral rights without just compensation. And um, so, so, I mean, as you can see, these cases were mainly driven by um, opposition to the oil and gas policies that were in the, the general plan. And, um, and so it's a handful dealing with all these. We've, this is the one case where we retained outside counsel to help just because of the volume of work. And so we retained um, Cox Castle Nicholson, which is a very um, well-respected uh, land use firm. Michael Zitsky is, is the main partner, and he actually is the author of the, the leading CEQA treatise for the state. And so he's very well-respected and... Um, and we're, we're, we're glad to have that firm's assistance. And so that it's gonna be a heavy lift for, um, especially for planning, but also for my office and putting the administrative record together for that case. And so that, again, that's the first step. Uh, and then it'll eventually be briefed and um, a hearing will be held. Um, so that's, um, yeah, sorry, I don't have a PowerPoint. I, I'd be happy to answer any more questions about any of the cases. Uh, I have a question. You mentioned on the wildlife corridors that some other NGOs have stepped up to uh, help defend the county. Has the same happened with respect to the challenges uh, about the 2040 general plan? Uh, n not yet. Now, that, that could happen, but, but that hasn't happened yet. Okay. 
Thank you. That's a very good report. Does anybody have questions of Jeff? Uh, Commissioner Educas. Yeah, um, I've heard tell that there's a referendum on our uh, uh, change to the ordinance regarding oil and gas. What have you heard about that? Oh, yeah, thanks for thanks for asking. I didn't mention it because it's it's not litigation, but it's yeah, it's it's interesting, and I haven't been through this before. But no, you're correct. Um, so that that has to do with the uh, the zoning amendments that. Um, that your commission recommended the board approve and that the board did approve by a three to two vote. Um, and so a re referendum petition is being circulated and, and uh, I haven't personally seen them, but my, my wife and kids have outside of uh, Sprouts actually. I'm not sure how many signatures are getting there, but um, I know they're, they're outside of a lot of different stores. Um, and so it's really interesting the way a, a, a referendum works under California law is that uh, a, a group has 30 days after uh, approval of um, legislation to um, obtain the, the necessary amount of, of um, voter signatures. In this case, it's 31,000 approximately signatures according to the county's election officials. And that is tied to, I believe, the number of, of actual voters in the last, I wanna say last presidential election or, or some prior election. So anyways, they need to get that number of votes within 30 days, um, which, which is tied to the, you know, the, an ordinance takes, there's a 30 day delay between um, adoption and effective date. And that's the exact reason why, to give people enough time to uh, qualify a referendum for the ballot. And so if they get enough votes, then the matter will return to the Board of Supervisors uh, not from planning, but from elections. And so under California law at that point, the board will have two options. One is to, to basically, um, uh, in this case, uh, um, retract or I'm not, repeal, I guess is the best word, repeal the, the zoning amendments um, and basically agree with the referendum or um, the board could put it on uh, a subsequent ballot and I'm sorry, I don't have the specifics here. I know it has to be at least 88 days after the board action. And it has to be like a, a, a spe not a special election, but a, a type of election. And I'm sorry, I don't know the, the specifics, but um, kind of like a bigger election. And so in the star, they said the, the first kind of big election where this could be on the ballot would be June, 2022. And the reason why that's important from the, the county's perspective is that, um, if a referendum does qualify for the ballot, then between the date they get enough votes basically and the date of the election and the, you know, the outcome of the election, the legislation or the ordinance does not take effect. And so it's as though it, it never passed. So- it, between, signature, between signatures? Yeah, yeah. You said votes, but you mean signatures? I, I'm sorry, signatures, yeah. And so basically if they get enough signatures, right, then it's it's put on hold. The ordinance is put on hold, and we're operating under the uh, you know the the, the pre ordinance status quo, if you will. And you said that the closest election would be if if the board chooses that option, twenty twenty two. That's what I read in the Star. I haven't independently verified that, but um, yeah, that's that's what I read, and that's from the elections folks. But again, I haven't confirmed that. Okay, great. Well, that's a great report. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's interesting to know that uh, sitting on the planning commission, we deal with uh, some consequential issues. Uh, do any commissioners want to bring anything up? Uh, now's the opportunity to do so. Uh, hearing none, the meeting is adjourned. Bye, everyone. Thank you.